Thank you, Gary. Thanks for those insights. That's certainly defence is an industry that I don't know a lot about, to be honest, so it was really interesting to hear that. Um, a special thanks to Kyle and Clint and everyone at CEDAR. They do a fantastic job. And um, also uh, some thanks to the lovely Susan Austin, who is always amazing to deal with at, at CEDAR. So Clint has given me a very broad, very broad mandate today to discuss investment in agriculture. So I'll do my best. Um, I'm just going to go through different types of capital um, that really gets involved in the institutional level agriculture investment. Um, <laughs> As Kyle mentioned before, I work at Laguna Bay, so I'm the CFO there. We're a fund manager. We specialise in investing in agriculture assets. Laguna Bay has investments across multiple sectors over a number of operating strategies. So we manage 12,000 hectares of almond orchards in down near Mildura. Um, that's Australia's second largest planting. So it's quite a big property there. Uh, but that's managed through a sale and leaseback arrangement. We, in another fund, we're now a top 10 dairy producer in um, the northwest, northwest of Tasmania, so we're on our way to producing 50 million litres of milk a year there. We also have one of the largest mixed cropping and livestock operations in the western districts of Victoria. We have around $190 million left to deploy in this current fund. It's a really interesting time for Australia and the agriculture sector. Australia has a natural advantage in producing many exportable agri agricultural commodities. Exportable goods are more significant to an economy's prosperity than non-exportable goods, as there's capacity for this market to grow much faster, and that's certainly seen in Australia with our relatively low population. Australia is also at a critical point in history. To date, global ag supply has kept up with demand, which has run at about 3% per annum. But this has really been driven by consumer demand in the UK, the US and the EU. Consumer demand in the rest of the world, and that's largely Asia, has been growing at 7% and supply has never been able to grow at the 7% rate. Australia is really in the box seat when it comes to capitalising on our natural, um, really geographical and expertise in the agriculture industry. David Littleproud, the Federal Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, has confirmed his support for the National Farmers Federation goal for growing farm production from $60 billion to $100 billion by 2030. This won't be achieved without significant investment into this sector, especially given the already high levels of, effic of efficiency and sophistication of many Australian farmers. Additional capital at the farm level provides a strong base for growth in output and yield. For cattle properties in the northern Queensland, the calculation is really simple. More investment means more fencing, more water points, more yards, which means beef producers can run cattle more efficiently and improve profitability. It's clear that there is increased demand for product, but we need more capital to grow. <clears throat> and where is this capital going to come from? An agricultural investment does not typically lend itself, <coughs> excuse me, I've got this, <coughs> your croaky throat, throat Kyle. An agricultural investment does not typically lend itself to short-term private equity style returns. Long-term patient capital is required with moderate return hurdles and the ability to ride out volatile years. Whilst foreign investment in Australia remains strong, unfortunately domestic investment has not been riding this trend and Australian super funds have not participated in the ag sector for a little while. In May, Scott Morrison, the Federal Treasurer, announced an inquiry into Australian superannuation funds participation in investment in agriculture. And with good reason. Australian super funds ho hold over $2 trillion worth of funds and their exposure to agricultural investment is 0.2 of a percent of their portfolios. This continues to be interesting when you consider that the ag sector makes up more than 10% of Australians' exports. Australian super funds have some structural constraints which don't lend themselves to long-term investment in ag. There are issues with liquidity, availability of assets, 
data and low levels of investment experience in the industry or with large-scale large institutional grade assets. Australian super funds need to have money immediately available when a superannuate retires or opts to move funds and they'll take the whole lot in one hit. Many Canadian and US pension funds operate under a defined benefit outcome with long lead times, 20 to 30 years. So this alleviates the liquidity constraint which is placed on Australian funds. Another constraint is the pool of assets appropriate for institutional level investment is small and tightly held. Data on returns is hard to obtain in ag, and it doesn't help that we haven't had many standout performances from an ASX listed point of view, which is the first place an investor will go to get a barometer on the financial performance of the sector. We, as an industry, we really do have to do better than this. The stability of returns and track record from real estate and infrastructure assets makes that class of asset attractive to a superannuation fund manager. I really do hope that we can overcome these constraints and get more Australian supers participating in the industry though. So while there seems to be a commitment from domestic super funds to invest in ag, will the speed and the quantum of that be enough to sustain the industry? Foreign investment has long filled the void with a long history of investing in Australian farmland. However, the composition is changing. The UK remains Australia's largest foreign landholder, followed by China and the US. China's ownership increased significantly last year following the Kidman transaction, moving from fifth place to second spot in terms of ownership. Overall, 12% of Australian farmland is foreign owned in some, some sort of manner. The US, Canada and the UK are experienced institutional investors in their own domestic agriculture markets. They understand the sector and are generally aligned with timeframes and returns. Northern American pension funds continue to show really strong interest in investing in Australia. Whilst it seems there are willing participants in funding capital for our industry requires to grow, the government has certainly been increasing the scrutiny on foreign investment and making it much more difficult for the industry to attract foreign capital. In 2015, the Foreign Investment Review Board, or FERB, as you probably know it as, they reduced the screening threshold for foreign investment from $252 million to $15 million. These applications cost up to $100,000 per application, which creates an additional burden for a foreign investor. FERB has further changed the rules by requiring a seller to advertise for a minimum of 30 days via channels an Australian bidder would reasonably access. This disadvantages vendors and buyers. Vendors are always, will always seek the highest price via market discovery, but they often want privacy, particularly in cases where outside capital is solving succession issues or where they're not 100% committed to sell their assets and they don't want to alarm staff and service providers. We have often seen staff leave and contractors not prioritise farms that are on the market. This rule also makes it nearly impossible to consolidate farms into scalable aggregations. We worry that if we create barriers to farm aggregation, the Australian agricultural, that Australian agriculture will follow in the footsteps of the subscale European model. Further, in March this year, the government announced a proposed change to tax rates applied to stapled structures. So stapled structures are very common in a range of industries in Australia, but also in agriculture. Trusts qualifying as managed investment trusts have rental income and capital gains components of distributions taxed at 15%. The proposed changes have these taxed at 30%. These changes have been described as levelling the playing field. This is sort of hard to accept given that Australian superannuation funds are taxed at 15% or 0% in pension phase. The average Australian farmer doesn't have the capital to access these institutional grade assets, so comparing to a corporate or personal tax rate is really irrelevant. It will be interesting to see how these, what impacts these changes will make. There are other types of capital that can play a role in agricultural investment. We've had a number of agricultural companies who have raised money via the ASX. There have been some success stories. With Treasury Wine Estates is a big winner, um, and a, but a large component of its business is based on downstream assets, processing and retail brands. Listed land-heavy agricultural stocks have typically traded at a discount to NAV and shareholders can be pretty impatient with regard to volatility of returns. 
Overall, there is no doubt the sector has strategic benefits and opportunities, and agricultural investment acts as a natural hedge against inflation. Historically, has had low correlation to traditional asset classes and is less impacted by economic slowdown. Whilst the operating returns can be volatile, the underlying asset is no more volatile than a traditional asset class. Private markets such as Australian, such as agriculture, offered added benefits for institutional investors of not being marked to market daily, rather through quarterly or annual valuations, which results in a lot of less volatility for an asset manager. So capital is one thing, but from an investor point of view, we have to find the right assets and then the right person to partner with to operate our assets. I'll be really broad brush here and say that most investors need to deploy a minimum of $50 million per investment with the opportunity to scale up from there. This requires a two plus million dollar per annum return to meet minimum return hurdles. At present, just under four and a half percent of Australian farms have returns over $2 million per annum. So this effectively rules out 95.5% of, of businesses in Australia, agricultural business, I should say. So we're in an industry where we only have 4.5% of assets that are open for business from an institutional investment perspective. Whilst there is a positive pipeline for deals in this range, good assets are hotly contested and prices are high. This, create challenge, this creates challenges, but it also creates opportunities. At Laguna Bay, we've chosen assets in locations where we can aggregate land holdings. We've started with cornerstone properties and we try to build scale by buying the surrounding properties. This is a lot of work though. <laughs> we have transacted 14 properties in the last 18 months just to build two platform assets. And you really need extensive teams with deep agriculture knowledge to be able to do this successfully. It doesn't suit all investor models and it's not something that everyone can achieve. As an industry though, we need to be more open to moving smaller holdings and subscale operations into large scale aggregations. Scale is essential to justify investment in technology, machinery and management, all things that are essential to improve performance. Finding the right asset is important, but finding the right partner to operate your assets is probably more important. The average age of the Australian farmer is approaching 60 years of age. Young farmers can't afford to buy out their mum and dad or siblings, and mum and dad just can't afford to retire. To help solve the succession, succession issues and attract, attract top young operators, we've designed a joint venture model to identify and finance good young operators. They still get to own their own farms, we purchase farms around them, creating scale, incentivise them with good salaries and percentage of profits, help drop their costs with scale, help with offtake arrangements and bring discipline and around capital allocation decisions. Most importantly, we have real success with this structure as there's true alignment between all stakeholders. If this sounds appealing to any young farmers in the room, I would encourage you to work on your financial history and data because this can be very overwhelming during the due diligence process. There are many benefits that come with institutional level investment in, in agriculture. Institutions generally have a corporate conscience they hold themselves accountable to and scale of investment and scale to justify the investment. At Laguna Bay, we invest heavily on health and safety through safe work practices and building the right safety culture for employees. We invest in training our farmers on both operational improvements and soft skills of leadership and personal development. We focus on offering career paths to rec retain and grow good staff. We're passionate about raising the right capital, investing in the right assets and operating them with integrity to help support the industry whilst making a reasonable return for our investors. The investment and operations of ag assets certainly has its challenges, but ag is clearly a growth industry. There is increased global demand for food in excess of our current supply capability and Australia remains well positioned to service that increased demand through greater levels of investment to boost efficiency and productivity. I hope that this has provided some insight into the ag industry, where we are going with investments, assets and structures that are required to support that. So thank you for your time. <laughs>